one. Welcome, feel good community, to the anniversary edition. I am joined by my man Mike, who is doing one of these rare episodes. I won't do these too often, but a reverse interview. We're going to be going through episodes twenty-seven through fifty-four of this year of the Feel Good Fatherhood show before. Uh, you get back to your regular listening and hang out for year two. So we're going to go each episode one by one. What were the main lessons? Have a a minor discussion, and we will introduce them by the search term so you can find the title and then the guest's name. Mike, I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so happy that we got to do uh, this particular review, and it's been incredibly enjoyable doing this uh, anniversary edition, and then reviewing all these crazy lessons and uh, reviewing them based on what's going on. So, uh, Mike, let's let's get going. Sounds great, man. And I appreciate you inviting me to come join you on this because, dude, it's not been like one area you're covering. There's been a whole slew of things that for us as dads, it's like, hey, what you're strong in, I may not be. And so there's something for everybody here as a dad to pull away and to be able to apply it, which I think is just amazing. You're not, you know, covering just one thing I can pull from. So I appreciate the variety. Um, so let's jump in. You said episode 27 and that was with Chris Felton approval addiction. What'd you pull out of that one? This was such a, I think such a painful listen. Uh, cause it, like it ended, it ended with like this, this great man who'd built this incredible empire and rebuilt his life and his marriage and reconnected with his kids. But the beginning was, I think, something that we pantomime and joke about for men and fathers. And that's just not being able or not willing to admit when we're making a mistake or when we need help. And I think that, you know, the, my note here is that it was dramatic, dramatic misunderstanding and lack of skill in one area, which was financial management of his business. That just imploded everything. Incredible, incredible levels of debt, incredible mismanagement of his funds. And he recognized that this was the thing that was getting him uh, into hot water. And so when he got around to his second marriage, was like, he walks in and tells a story about how he walks into his new new wife and his and he's like, I'm in trouble. And I loved, I love this because as the story goes, he says, I'm in trouble. We got to do something. She kind of takes the horns is a little bit of a, what the F happened? (laughs) And then here's how we're going to get out of it. And what I loved, because in this part, I think the most inspirational piece, and I think that many of us as uh, spouses need to realize this is that you got to come together and leverage each other's strengths. And this is the main lesson of this episode is that, that I guess you could say vulnerability, but just the humility of saying, yep, can't do this. Yep. Need your help. Can I lean on you? Great. <laughs> that was, that was, that was Chris. And uh, he's been, he's been such a great uh, uh, cheerleader and support uh, offline as well. Mm. And yeah, being able to lean on somebody. I mean, if you can't lean on them, um, it's like what happens when the kids are gone or, you know, further on down towards retirement, it's like, you got to learn it. It doesn't get any easier. So being able to, like you talked about, be humble and ask for help and being honest. Like I tried hiding it from my wife was like, nope, you don't have the shoulders to carry this. (laughs) such the wrong perspective <laughs> but that's 100%. that's healthy uh, it absolutely is the the correct thing to do and uh specifically on the topic of it, it could be hard to admit these things it's like lifting weights the first time you pick up that you know let's say a 40 pound dumbbell it's going to be heavy the 1000th time that you pick up the 40 pound dumbbell it will not be as heavy very true Dude, let's move on to episode 28, Overcome Helplessness with Kendall Munson. I loved this interview because in the fatherhood space, there are not very many of us that are stay-at-home dads. And the angle, because Kendall's not a stay-at-home dad, but the angle here is that 
spending the majority of their day with their kids. The the only other guest I believe that I had that was in this space was Brett Gordon as sort of the stay-at-home dad. And he was an educator. So he was in, uh, he's an elementary school teacher. And so I was really paying attention to what lessons and things he was talking about because he literally had a career where he spent the majority of his time around kids. So talk about insight, talk about wisdom, talk about experience and being able to just leverage that and just listen to what he's saying and say, oh, okay, this is great. And he really talked about like actualizing kids, giving them goals, believing what they can do. And the one thing I think that's critical that even in my journey, I've been struggling with uh, recently with my eldest is they may look like an adult, but they're not yet an adult. And so for him, it was the whole idea of speaking and bringing these more adult concepts to the level of the kid. And that that was really the big unlock there, plus the the purpose and the, the specific skill. But just being able to recognize that maybe you can explain rocket science to a kid. <laughs> uh, it's all, you never know what's possible until you try, right? That's right. Well, and this one, this next one, episode 29, Adam Hill. Adam's amazing. Had him as a guest and absolutely loved his story, what he learned, how he shares things. This was Unseen Plague Overcoming Self-Absorption. What stood out for you on this one? First off, uh, another brief uh, thing for Adam. He's got the podcast uh, Flow Over Fear. He's been doing some pretty pretty fun things on YouTube, and um, I have an inside track on some things, so he's got some cool stuff coming in 2024. The, the core thing here was how, how he had re-engineered his life and how he stepped through from uh, you know his his addictive up like not his addictive upbringing but like his habits and how he had sort of engineered his life in a specific way healed them and then was stepping into a I'm healed I've been healing and then healing his family so his you know one of his family members had an eating disorder and then helping that family member with it the fact that he had panic attacks and fear and other mental health challenges and he was going through them. But I think I think really the the most fun thing and this this unfortunately is not covered in the interview but it was it was a, an offline conversation that he and I had was he ended up using social media algorithms to his advantage. And the way that he did that was I thought really genius. So he he put out for years one dad joke a day on his social media and then would only engage with other dad joke things. And so now when he goes on to like Facebook or Instagram or one of those other platforms, all he sees are like dad jokes and fun things. And so it's it 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 kind of gets rid of the doom scrolling, kind of gets rid of the echo chambers and other elements. And I mean, I guess it does create an echo chamber, but it's an echo chamber of like fun and delight and puns and humor, which is which I think we need more of. But that was, uh, I mean, it was really fun. And Adam and I did a, a guest exchange. So I ended up going on to Flow Over Fear. You can learn a couple pieces there about my life that I go into. And then yeah, he came over and that was a lot of fun. So those were the things I really learned about Adam. Yeah, Adam's a great guy, very humble and uh, just super encouraging as well. So for episode 30, you had Fatherhood and Gaming with Derek Chin. Um, How did that impact you? Like, what were your takeaways from that one? As we improve and as we age, our social groups are going to change. So Derek is a former work colleague and friend from my time in video games. And I ended up working with him after I was working at Sony Online on EverQuest Next. Uh, Great team, had a super good time. And it was really fun to connect with him because it had been almost like 10 years since I had spoken to him. And I was like, huh, here's this uniqueness. Here's this personal branding thing that I can bring in that not many other people in the personal development and influencer space come from video games and and stuff. Like, There's plenty of geek 
critics and commentators, but not many people are like me where we made games and he's currently making games, uh, but and then kind of transfer over. And so it was super fun to just connect with him and catch up on that lighter side of life and and get like his take on on what his fatherhood journey was. And and this is not covered, but we ended up speaking and reconnecting for like an hour and a half afterwards. <laughs> I ended up canceling like four appointments afterwards. And I was just like, oh, I'm just gonna talk to Derek today. Uh but he he ended up doing a reset and going on an adventure. He RV'd with his family for a year. He dipped into and did some of the more traditional uh home maker roles uh during that time period. So he would like prepare food and He's had this really nice navigating, I guess, I don't even know. It's so weird that we have to use these these terms like the traditional gender roles where it's like they haven't been traditional for like 20 years. So I don't even know why we're talking about them as traditional, but he, I guess it's just the difference between the providing business career side versus the home making side. And he and his wife did this. And for those of you listening, I'm kind of doing this weave from one to the next. Um, I can hear my I can hear my baby going. So if you're listening, you can probably hear my baby too. Um, this is the wonder of recording it in the evening. Uh, welcome to fatherhood, everybody. So Derek, <laughs> that's why so, we're doing this, right? I mean, this is the real aspect of life. I know it's and it's such a good time. I'm really excited that this is when we're doing it. Uh, this particular episode. Uh, so that was it. Was fun to connect with him, and I think. It was good to have a discussion about gaming and sort of its its impact and and because he and I both have a different perspective because we're not consumers, we're creators. And so we're we have a different view of the impact of what we're creating because we we see it on both like an individual scale, but also on the larger social social scale. And then finally, uh, and this is more because he's also got this like entrepreneurial side to him. And uh he just talked about, um, what would you call it? Luck, I guess luck, that a big piece about being the right person at the right time in the right place. Like most people say right time, right place. But I add for the right person. That's the, that's the, the difference here. That's the, the missing piece from that equation is that it's not always right time, right place, but it's also being the right person. And Derek put this very well that Part of that luck, creating your own luck, is being observant and open rather than hanging out where you are. And this really, for my journey, comes to what are you willing and open to say yes to, and then what are you saying no to? Uh, More on this in the in the coming year. That's that's what there. But that the luck comes from being observant was a really great lesson from that episode. Yeah, prepping yourself ahead of time to be ready for when those come up as well. Instead of like, hey, when it when this opportunity comes around, then I'll prepare. Doesn't work that way. So not. definitely being <laughs> observant is uh, part of it. So yeah, that's a crucial, crucial part of it. Well, on episode thirty one with uh, Doherty Pierre Paul, that was exhaustion to uh, six figure career. What you know drew your attention and and remained with you. I what I loved is that. A lot of my guests in, in are entrepreneurs and they're very successful business people and they have. And so it, it can be very daunting if you're a five figure employee to identify with somebody who's earned, who's earning like seven figures, who has like either a seven figure business, an eight figure business, or earns upwards of seven figures a year or very high into the sixes. It's, it's, it's a very different life. And what I really appreciate appreciated about Doherty was this was a transition from what you would consider, I don't what would you consider this basic minimum wage work? So he was earning like 15 to 20 to 25 an hour, which is the vast majority of America of the U S. Um, and he had this crisis in his life and then just said, okay, well, in order for me to have things I want, I got to earn more. I want to have a better career. I don't want to go through this. He collapsed from exhaustion, which was a Mm. not so thing. Um, And then just 
built the next career. And what I loved about that is that it was very close to my path where I didn't collapse from like exhaustion or anything like that, but I, I just said, okay, well, I don't want to do this. So I'm going to just go do it, like go do that next thing. And I've been reflecting a lot on this because it has to do with discipline and some of these other words that we don't like in that it, it really is these small steps that I was just talking with a buddy of mine just, just before this thing. And we were talking about things that it, it just kind of happened that the way that the conversation went was, what are the things about other people that you just don't understand? And so he had this deal. He's a really this automation business building guy. And so he was talking about Zapier and just, I don't get, I won't, pe- people won't pay 10 bucks a month for Zapier to free up like 10 to 20 hours a month of their time. I just don't understand it. And I said, I have the same thing about YouTube. And he was like, what do you mean? And I said, well, I, what I don't understand is this, is that YouTube is the single largest information hub on the planet. You can learn everything you need on YouTube. And we know that when you change your focus or there's a disruption in your focus that you lose the momentum on whatever it is you're doing. That means ads. And so I've always say, what is what precisely is stopping you from paying the 10.99 or the 10 bucks a month for YouTube premium so you don't have to get ads so you can just watch your thing and get the knowledge and get the information or the entertainment that you want ad free? Oh, and by the way, it supports the creators and supports the platforms. Like, come on. Like What's going on here? And, uh, and so he, um, he joined YouTube premium. And then I sent him the one of us meme, one of us, one of us. And so that was good. But anyways, for Doherty, it was, I started with the idea that well, a lot of my guests are higher end entrepreneurs and they're, they're earning a very, a, a very big thing. But, uh, whether you're listening, it doesn't really matter where you are, but you could be anywhere in the five figures or six figure area. All it takes is a little bit of application to get to that next thing. When I was, when I made the jump from my standard career, I had a, and I, I don't mind saying this, when I started, I was earning, um, I was earning, what was I earning? I was earning 35, basically 35 a year to do the tech support that I was doing. I got into data analysis and I became an applications analyst and I got a $10,000 raise, which was huge, 25% raise, raise. And then, um, and, but that, that effort was from, I studied at home. So I, at, when I got home at night, I just put the time in to, to learn the new skill. And then when I made the jump to video games, I did the exact same thing. And now what I'm doing with my business consulting, personal branding and marketing work, I'm, I did the exact same thing. I'm just studying. Mm. Uh, like I just study all the time now. And so it, it, any of those, um, Anything that you want to do is just a matter of studying. And is it is it worth not watching Netflix and not watching that movie or not watching YouTube <laughs> to to uh, to to improve yourself? And the jump doesn't have to be from low five figures to seven figures. That doesn't have to be the jump because it's a super meaningful change to go from low five figures to high five figures. That's a big jump. Yeah. And and why not? And if you're listening to this, why not? If, if you've got an hour a day, read a business book, like, and not a business education book, like read a hard skill book, learn data analysis, learn programming, learn ma- management and leadership techniques, learn effective communication, learn presentation skills. There's tons of things. Watch a YouTube video, but, but then apply what you've learned and you can improve your life. That's what I learned from Doherty. And it can even be a 15 minute investment per day, right? That cumulatively is going to add up. You know, if you look at it and go, I just don't have an hour. Great. Start with what you have because those skills that you learned 10 years ago were built upon to what you're doing now. It's not like wasted time, wasted experience. It all builds upon itself so that as you move from five figures, your figures, your skills for six figures will build upon what you've already done and, and the, the investment that you've made on researching and, and you know, gaining that experience. So it's not like a, a one-time investment. It keeps on giving as you go through that. 
I, I have one final thing to say on this, this piece, because this is a really big part of the feel good methodology is this continual learning, this Kaizen mentality develop like, and, and balancing your development between a hard skill, which is something that you're learning, a soft skill, which is how you have and uh, navigate through relationships and your spiritual skills, like your spiritual, emotional skills, which is how you manage your internal and external world with, with regards to your faith with regards to your your emotional state, that kind of jazz. And that's that the best skills are the ones that you that challenge you and that you may or may not understand. So it and it's okay to not get them. And it's okay for it to be challenging to you and for it to be above your head. But as you immerse yourself into the education, meaning if you have a topic you're learning about and you approach it from four or five different angles, you'll learn more things. I took a hardcore machine learning and data, AI data analysis course well before I was ready. And I didn't, and I learned a little bit of Python while I was taking this course. I ended up learning to do some uh, machine learning algorithms in both Python and R, which are programming languages for those of you that don't know. So, and it should be uncomfortable. And if the person and the video you're watching is over your head, watch it again and then read the supplemental material. But sometimes, and this is the part that I learned, using the skill and applying it, that's the thing where the learning happens. That's that time when the learning happens. So it's not just consuming information. It's having, and I, my rule is 4X. So the rule for, feel, for the Feel Good community is one hour of learning, four hours of application. One hour of learning, four hours of application. I'll say it one more time. One hour of learning, four hours of application. And that's, uh, that's how you learn something new. Okay, we, that's, that's Doherty. That's there. We, we got to go. We got to go, Mike. Let's go. Right. <laughs> Episode 32, creating confident teams with Scott Grades. What, uh, what was your big takeaway from there? Number one, uh, I love when I have an interview with a guest and I have live learning on the spot. And this was, I believe I was talking with uh, Scott during it and he, he said something and I was like, holy moly, I'm going to apply that immediately because I was doing this and now I'm going to do this afterwards. That was, uh, I think, a fantastic moment for me as a host. Uh, please surround yourself by people that stretch you and motivate you. Uh, very related to our previous conversation. I think the most significant thing, and I've been, I am such a broken record about this, is that this, stop with the meetings. Stop with the time of the meetings. We're in a new digital ecosystem. Cal Newport is a um, fucking hero. That'll be my one, my one swear for YouTube. Uh, and it's and I and I've said this so much to my managers, my leads, my colleagues all the time. It's can this meeting be replaced by a memo? Can this meeting be replaced by a memo that you, that you read? And then when you go to the meeting, you say, do you have any questions on the memo? And if nobody's read it, then they spend that 15 minutes reading the memo. Not only was it a rule that Scott talks about, but Amazon does the same thing. For high-level executive and director-level meetings at Amazon, they take the first 30 minutes to read the freaking memo. So it's really important. Like what's, what's important here is it's the use of time and the efficacy. I've been in one-way communications meetings where the people that are supposed to be communicating the information are solving the problem within the meeting. So mm. rather than it being a communication as in, I'm here listening to do my job better, that they're actively doing the work in the meeting instead of doing it beforehand. What a colossal waste of time especially when you get into larger teams. 15-minute meetings, folks, it is critical. Critical. That's it. That's right. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all love long meetings, right? Right. Um, episode 33, Addiction to Strength with Jeremy Newsom. I think the one thing that really just sums up this entire conversation, because it was actually fantastic, was let your kids see you sweat. That means working hard. Let them see you fail. That means don't hiding, don't hide it from them. Let them see you learn. The things that you do in front of them, they will adopt. We are continually amazed by 
the reading habits of our eldest. But then when we reflect on the first five to seven years of her life, who was reading? Both of us. We were both reading constantly. We both always had a book or a Kindle in front of us and we're just constantly reading. She probably reads an hour to two a day. And just like when you, when you look at the kids today, and so for the recording, it's 2003. If you're listening to this in the future, think about how much your kids are consuming digital media or watching something or interacting with a game. So those are kind of the three bigger activities. Just your kids will mimic what you do. And that's really the Jeremy Newsom thing. And then the other big lesson from him was just, um, just learn about money. Just learn about money. Learn the rules. You don't have to do everything. Like you don't have to do everything. If you, I follow um, the FIRE community, which is the Financial Independence Retire Early community. And I remember a great conversation be, by one influencer. Uh, this is Mr. Money Mustache, who created his, his basically his, his goose, his, um, his nest egg through stock investing. And another one who had the exact same net worth out of real estate investing. Both had comparable qualities of life. It doesn't matter the vehicle. It just matters that you learn and do something. Okay. Yeah, I think the, the crucial thing is what you talked about, letting our children see us fail. Mm. Like, dude, I wish I had done that at a younger age instead of creating this um, expectation of perfection, right? Not giving them that permission to take the risk to see what comes about because like when I look back, how I felt about it is what I passed off on my children. Mm. And that risk tolerance is so crucial just for finding the success, right? If you go into real estate or you go into stocks or stuff like that, there is a certain tolerance that you've got to say, Hey, yeah, I'm willing to take the risk to, to see the possible future. Um, and when we set them up to only see success, that kind of creates this expectation of, hey, you don't have permission, you don't have this space to take a chance and not succeed. And, and that's just detrimental. So creating that space, like Jerry talked about, you know, to let your kids see you sweat and fail builds something that's just so extremely powerful for them to possess and embrace as they, you know, continue to grow um, that puts them on a different path than than when they don't have that risk tolerance, right? 100%. So, all right. Next one is episode 34, Stepping Out of Your Comfort Zone in Fatherhood by uh, Fred Joyle. Joyle. Okay. Fred Joyle. Fred Joyle. I got you. Directly related to this, directly related to only simulating success, only showing success, never showing failure, is that Fred's perspective on this idea called boldness, it, it really relates to confidence. And what he says is that most of us are situationally confident. We're not overall confident. And so there's one area or domain where, we're, where we have this boldness, this confidence muscle. So if you need an example for what this, how this manifests and looks like in your life, think about your, who you talk to or what you talk about and what you would admit and discuss with sort of your... Um, your closest friends versus your acquaintances. And I'm not saying share the things you would with your close, with you, to your closest friends with your acquaintances. That's not what I'm saying. The whole idea is that there's a boldness there. And his whole brand is about taking that situational boldness and extending that to other arenas. And you do that by taking baby steps. Uh, the other, the other big thing here, because uh, a big part of this boldness thing has to do with like friendships and creating more friendships and more meaningful relationships, and it it bears repeating here that, and this is a statistic that we've discussed a lot on the Feel Good Fatherhood show, that twenty percent of the male population in the United States has one or fewer friends, and a friend here is defined as somebody that you could call on in the middle of the night. And you needed support. This is a um, this is the worst that it's been since we've measured it. And this is based on two data points: one in the eighties, and one uh, very recently. I think it was in the uh, the teens, the late 
the late teens of the 2000s, so 20, like 16 or something like that. Uh, and it went from less like about 5% to 20%. And so there's a handful of episodes on the show that talk about this, uh, but Fred Joyle is going to be really great about learning some boldness. Uh, his book, Super Bold, fantastic read for developing, developing a new skill. Uh, Bob Gilmet, if you're a person that can, uh, he had a whole thing about friendships and relationships in general, finding some good close friends, just go ahead and do it. Uh, from my own teaching and stuff that I used to do when I was a confidence coach was a lot about just finding a place where you're kind of, you have your cheers area. So finding where you're a local and continuing to visit that and build basically that whole idea is to build a, a group of friendships and a social circle around an activity that you enjoy. So for me, it was about fine art, which is paintings and local art galleries, and then uh, uh, jazz dancing. So swing dance, Lindy Hop, Balboa. And those were the two communities that I built my social networks on when I was in my 20s. The same thing can happen as you get older. It doesn't matter where it is. If you're in a gym, go build a community of people at the gym. If you're, um, if you're into sports, go do that. Find a place where people are watching that or have them over. Watch the sport. Uh, I spent a lot of my 20s playing poker and watching the NFL game. So the foosball game, I don't watch too much football today, but I used to. And <laughs> but the, the point here being is that there's, there's, a, there's an epidemic of friendship uh, that is only addressed through effort and um, camaraderie. And that's a, that's a big part of the Feel Good Fatherhood way. Yeah, and it's an important skill to have because as we look at the statistics, as we as men get older, that percentage gets higher to the point where men in retirement are so lonely, they're taking that ultimate decision and saying, I can't handle this anymore. So having that skill to both build the friendships, foster those, and then keep them, that's something that, I mean, that's a lifelong skill to have and something to be intentional about just for not only you know, like our health, but the health of those around us, because, you know, that's how we are is going to impact those around us. Right. So that's an 100%. important skill to have. Mm -hmm. All right. So we move on to episode 35, setting goals and rewarding success with uh, chef Chris. This was such a great interview, uh, from the perspective of, it was a really different view into parenting and family. We talked about how he was working in his restaurant and he would work nights. So he wasn't available for some things. And then his wife was working in, I, I, you would say, traditional, traditional job. And so she worked days. So there was some stress on the time, right? On the time with the family, time with each other, that kind of jazz. And I think that this is something uh, I love it when, and there's a handful of points in the world, uh, specifically, there's an episode later on, we talk about Tanner Welsh's story of these perspectives that just bring, bring challenges and success into focus. And I think if you spent just a minute to think about your life right now and how very likely, if you're an average person, that your you're working during the day, your spouse is working during the day, your kids are in school, and you're all home together at night. And you have a little bit of time. And it might not be a lot of time, but you have a little bit of time. And how, for some people, that's not normal. And that they're able to build legacy, and they're able to build family, and they're able to build relationships with their kids. So for me, it just becomes super confrontational. Just like, well, why can't you? I, the journey that I took was I was in a situation, I was on a career, and um, this was in, when I was in video games where I recognized if I stay this path, there will be weeks, months at a time where I'll be up before my daughter, daughters get up and then home after they're in bed. And I was like, nope, this isn't what I want. And so there's that intentionality that we talked about with the friendship just a moment ago. But it, the intentionality of, of building and taking advantage of the time and the opportunities that you have 
I think that's something really important. There's some other things I learned in this episode, but it's a really good one. <laughs> We're just going to move on. But but just just uh, really take advantage. Carpe diem. Carpe diem. Uh, that means seize the day. That means um, today's the only day you got to worry about. And so make today the best day you can. Yeah, there were there were a number of years. Three out of our four kids were born, and my wife and I were on those opposite schedules, and it is challenging more so than you know the normal or average routine where we're both at home at night with the kids. Dude, we were passing like ships in the in the night, and so you've really got to be intentional about your communication, what's going on, and how you're working as a team even more so there. Um, so yeah. <laughs> That is is definitely one to navigate carefully and intentionally. So with uh, Chesley in episode 36, what what were your big takeaways in evolution of fatherhood in the digital age? This one really blew my mind. And it was the description of didactic learning. And really, let's just like make it not a big word. What it means is the difference between thinking, reasoning, and emotioning and motioning your way through different situations in life. And what he was able to articulate for me was this idea that as the speed and pace of knowledge and information increases at a person, the reasoning side of their brain turns off, and then they default to the pattern, routine, and emotion side, which is a very fixed viewpoint. And so it's the whole idea that People don't think about the things that they, it's, once I say it, you'll understand. People don't think about the things that they see on the internet. They just feel about them because there's so much information. And so the, the, the idea, um, and I think, I think that there are some people that can reason. I I think this is the, in every situation, there's always going to be some sort of anomaly or, um, uh, habits or people that have some sort of superpower in this space. And so, yes, there are people that can consume information at that pace, at the pace of social media and respond in a reasoning manner to it. So then the rest of us, (laughs) right? So then the 99 or the 95% rest of us that don't, let's just get into the rest of the discussion, why this is significant. Because it really is a model, again, this is recorded in 2023, for what's happening in the world. If we don't take the time to show our kids how to slow down and think about things by creating space, just creating, I call it silent time, just let them, and really what this is, this is called boredom, B-O-R-E-D-O-M, boredom, force your kids to be Bored, B O R E D, bored. That means that they have a space where they're not consuming digital. They're not playing games. They're not hanging out with somebody. They just have to entertain themselves. Typically, this is when they go outside and play in nature, that it creates space for them to think. And fancy this if you think it's true for kids, do you think it's true for you? (laughs) I knew you were, I knew you knew. I was watching your face. I knew you knew I was going to do this. So we're bringing it back around, but it's really, so, okay. So this one, I've really thought a lot about, and I've really spent a lot of time really reflecting on, um, just unplug and, and just give yourself time to think. So every morning now, I just, I watch the sunrise with my cup of coffee and I make sure I do it for 10 to to 20 to 30 minutes. Some mornings I'm just reflecting on my day. What's the work I have to do? What are my appointments? Some mornings I'm like, that's a pretty cool sun. And that's about what my brain's doing. Some days I'm like, hey, this is a great cup of coffee. Other days I'm like, oh, I can't wait for this thing. And so like every every kind of thought, every idle thought that you would have, I just allow it to happen because I'm just Mm -hmm. prepping myself with space in the morning, not on my phone. I'm not reading a book. I'm just sitting there enjoying the cup of coffee and enjoying nature. And by that, I just, I'm watching the sunrise. These are this, whatever the habit is, just, you can go do that. You know, for some people it's having a bath for some people. It's like, maybe it's shower time. Like there's an epidemic of people taking long showers. Why not let them, right? Maybe you do your best thinking in the shower, more power to you, whatever it happens to be. 
create some space, do some thinking. It'll be good for you. Yeah. Or going to the park or, you know, just a walk around your neighborhood, but taking that time to step out of always being on, whether it's scrolling on your phone, uh, watching YouTube, right? <laughs> is just mm-hmm. detaching. Um, dude, we, we don't realize how much we're plugged in and turned on until we step away. And I, I mean, it's almost like, uh, you know, when you eat so much, you're never hungry. And then when you don't have something to eat or to drink, then those like feelings and, and triggers come back. It's the same thing you're talking about, like taking this time, stepping away to become aware of, you know, what's going on and being able to discern what's going on around you and in your life. So yeah, being able to quiet things and slow it down. In 2024, I expect to have a couple more health influencers on the show so we can learn more about this. (laughs) You mean it's important? Come on, Jay, really? I just want to, I just want to scroll TikTok and have my coffee in the morning and, and get going. You mean that's not what I should be doing? All right, let's jump in. Ben Colloy was episode 37, Journey of a Father Embracing the Power of Hello. What was your big takeaway from this one? Two, two core pieces will be kind of concise and succinct here. Uh, ben is a specialist in helping men figure out the kind of legacy that they want to create. And a lot of people are like, well, I don't really know how to create a legacy or what's my legacy. And uh, the the very straightforward and direct answer to this is that, well, whatever it is you're doing now is your legacy. So just, just think about that. Think about, think about the statement, whatever we're doing now is your legacy. The The second piece, go ahead, go ahead, brother. Obviously that feeds into what we talked about earlier of creating that, uh, that whole sweat, right? And your risk and everything. This is part of the legacy we're going to leave, right? It's not just financial. Not just financial. Financial is it's an important piece of it. Uh, interesting statistic here. 60% of all wealth, not 60%, I'm sorry. 60% of the, of the U.S. population, the only transfer of wealth is the family home. Hmm. So reflect on that one. Uh, uh, yeah. There, uh, I would love for there to be some legislation through the U.S. government to pass that would allow for people to put their family homes in trust, and so that it is forced to go through to the next of kin. And what that allows, when you put something in a trust, it bypasses uh, probate law, which is basically taxes on inheritance. Mm-hmm. Um, and not that most homes are going to do that, but I mean, who knows? Uh, unless the inheritance laws change. Uh, most homes within 10, 15 years might be above the price of or above the value that you can inherit. Most homes, that's totally wrong. My numbers are a little bit off here, but the idea being that like, hey, if 60% of the population only ever transfers wealth through the home, then we should make that easier. Uh, the number two, the number three thing, back to, back to Ben, because this was about legacy, right? So back to Ben was uh, a big piece of his was just about saying hello and kind of being a pleasant conversationalist and just being open to meeting new people. And the, the, the funny thing here is that my wife says, like, he's going rogue, he's going Canadian. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, so I have this habit where I will just go have a conversation with my neighbors or the clerk in the store or a random stranger somewhere. And uh, uh, beware, if you live on my street, I will walk over and talk to you. Uh, <laughs> it's just... Uh, maybe it's a friendly thing, but she, she teases me on going, going Canadian. And, and that's something that I learned a lot from the, the Ben Colloy it was just the, the reaffirmation that what I was doing was good. I'll, I'll have to let my wife know that, <laughs> <laughs> that I'm going Canadian as, yes. as well. Oh my gosh, man. And now I have an excuse and a name for it. So I, I feel, you know, validated on this. Let's, uh, let's move over to Chris Lewis in episode 38 rise of engaged fathers there were two gentlemen this year that i met that i was really excited to meet and they were uh brian anderson that we talked about in the previous the part one episode plus his interview and then uh chris lewis and so they are the longtime community builders of uh fathering together and then dads with girls oh man i'm gonna anyways just maybe this will be in the description 
uh, the links to these. But uh, Girl Dads, and it was about uh, uh, two gentlemen that taught me a lot about uh, building community. And right when I was learning about community, they were there, just happenstancely, uh, right time, right place, right person, to have a conversation about building community and being a part of community. And 15 years running, started their communities at the beginning of really the, sort of the, the beginning of the uptick in social media. I think that they were one of the first groups on Facebook. Uh, in fact, I believe they were building the community and then Facebook actually recognized them and invited them to have the group. Uh, there's some details in the Brian Anderson interview about that, but Chris Lewis was uh, the sort of the co-founder of that piece. And um, just girl dads. Uh, the other thing that we talked about here was sort of the definitions of fatherhood are changing. And I want to very quickly acknowledge that I think the idea that any person must be or not be a particular version of fatherhood or role or whatever the nonsense we can come up with in the common culture is bubkiss. And what's important here is that definitions are changing. And so it's up to you to pick what kind of father you want to be. That's a super feel good fatherhood value. And that um, it's not universal. So if you are the stay-at-home dad, as some of my guests are, then do it and make sure that your spouse supports you in that. Uh, that's the other thing. You got to be, you got to have your spouse align with what you're doing. If you want to be the go-getter, uh, you know, you want to be the go-getter earner and then, you know, your, your, your spouse wants to be the homesteader, go do that. Like, why not? Uh, the, the, there's no hard and fast rule. I think that's the best thing that we got from, from Chris Lewis's interview. Mm. Let's move on to embracing imperfection with Andrew Anderson, episode 39. What was impactful for you out of that one? Number one, great book, uh, strength of the oak, strength of the willow. And that translates directly to this. You are strength of the oak, which is a strong tree with great roots, unbending for non-negotiables. These are your values. You got things that you value, things that are important to you. Then be unmoving. They're non-negotiables. Other things, meh, be flexible, be a willow. Let the wind blow. It doesn't, if it's not important to you and it doesn't matter, don't engage with it. Just let it be. Uh, just, just really great reinforcement of the values. Actually, really good, really good interview as well. Uh, the Andrew Anderson interview I thought was, was really good. Um, the other big piece here that I thought was good as a girl dad. So if you're a girl dad, uh, go listen to this one. He goes into helping his daughters receive a complicant without seeking validation from it. If you've done any study or have any knowledge about how women are treated in the dating market and sort of the, the sheer amount of attention that a woman receives based on her attractiveness, there's some really interesting discussion and experts that are coming out about this. Teaching your daughter to receive a compliment and then not receive external validation from what's happening, but be internally motivated. Uh, that's the difference between extrinsic, externally motivated, and intrinsic motivation uh, through life. Really understated and undervalued. I think this is something particularly that everybody should go. But if you're uh, an attractive woman, you're going to hear all the time that you're an attractive woman. And that can become a habit. Uh, I have a lot to say on this. I think I'll have to do an episode about it. <laughs> so, uh, but this was a really great uh, springboard into this this particular episode. I'll, I'll probably do a solo to talk about this a little bit more because there's, there's tons of examples from comedians, the impact on the laughter and external validation, and it's it's this is a there's a lot of stuff here about external validation versus internal. External validation doesn't impact us as guys. Come on, Jay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> that that is tongue in cheek that that is something that yes jay needs to do the solo episode so we can dive into that one so uh next episode was episode 40 overcoming lust with fred stoker what was great series in oh go ahead no i was gonna say like what was with this one what was like your big takeaway that that left you kind of contemplating after the episode there's a lot of things about sexual purity and uh, 
the feel good fatherhood motto is face the family, face your spouse. So it's whatever it is that you're doing, um, a big piece of your efforts day in, day out are number one, accepting of other people that are going through a similar path, which is being very family focused in this brief window of your life where you, you're, you have the privilege of being family focused, but then also, um, extending that into the sexual realm with, uh, you know, for, for Fred, uh, that was your wife for us. It's our wives. Um, you know, but for anybody, not that it's your spouse. So, and this is just really channel your sexual energy into your spouse. Your spouse is the most significant relationship and the longest lasting one you have in your entire life next to your siblings. If you have them, I'll say that one more time because I think it's significant. The relationship and length of time you have with your spouse and how long it could be, um, please stay married for as long as you can. Everything is overcomable um, with a handful of exceptions. Uh, Tanner Welsh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, <laughs> um, the relationship you have with your spouse is the longest running relationship you'll have in your life. And it is the most significant one. Uh, Because it's really the first major relationship next to your friends that you opt into and you share the most with. So why not, um, especially as a man, turn off the porn, turn off the um, shit, turn off the uh, what the the GQs, Esquires, the Vogues, like don't look at those images and just kind of like focus on on your wife. So here's here's how to do it. Here here's the 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 one tip and trick for this episode that I thought was great is that you can't lust over something that that you're looking at out of the corner of your eye. So if you don't look at it, you can't lust after it. And so it was just a great accountability and attention discussion on uh, that one piece was like, yeah, so if if the the hot girl's out, just don't look at her and you won't lust over her. And then look at your wife instead or look at your friends or, you know, maintain good eye contact. I mean, shit, there's a ton ton of different things you can do. But uh, Uh, This is related, and I think we'll just go into, because it's a two-part thing, like the next thing is anger. And so here's the the branching branching comment, is that the two things, if you want to be a uh, viewed as a man with high self-control, high accomplishment, it's you have to overcome these two things, overcome your lust and overcome your anger. If you can overcome those two elements in your life, those two emotions in your life, those two states in your life, you can pretty much accomplish just about anything, and you can pretty much accomplish what the, the things that you want in your life. So um, I know it's a little bit broken record, but uh, he's got some great books, has been having the conversation for like 30 years, which is why the quality of the interview I thought was really good. Uh, but then really, it's just, just, you know, like face your wife, just like face, like be sexually pure, just, just do that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's kind of worth it. You're, you're investing your time and attention into somebody that loves you. Like why not keep doing that? Okay. Anger. Uh, the next piece. We're just going to, we're just going, right? <laughs> so um most of your anger comes from uh specifically uh unresolved things in your past and uh it doesn't really need to be anything more than that but the the goal of the feel good fatherhood community and specifically i think for men is to have more peace in your life like there's just 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 aim for more peace in general um even like even to the point where it's like Having solid boundaries means that you prevent people from infringing on your peace. That's a critical thing that people have to understand about peace. Peace does not mean always turning the cheek and allowing people to do whatever they're doing. That's not what peace means. Peace means that you have something that is sacred and that it's guardable and that you maintain. And you maintain it however you have to. So so that can just simply be approaching somebody and saying, I don't appreciate what you're doing. Please stop it. You're not invited to this table. Um, so having a good boundary and protecting your peace is, is critical. And, and just understand that here's what's going to happen when you, when you establish that there's a boundary. The people that are most offended when you have a boundary and you communicate that boundary are the people that don't have any. And so you're learning a lot about a person and the way that they react when you have a boundary. And so most of the time, if you communicate that you have a boundary or somebody else communicates that they have a boundary, and then they kind of just, they, they, they don't skip a beat and they just keep moving forward. It just means that they respect that you have a boundary as long as they stop and they change the behavior. That's like, that's a key thing there. I know we went into anger, but really it's like anger and, and handling anger is really about peace. 
And the part about there's unresolved drama, traumas, whatever happens to be, I'm going to have this great interview with a, a, a former therapist. Uh, her name's Doc, uh, Nicole Runyon later on in 2024. It's fascinating, this, this discussion. I learned about this offline um, with her. And so we're going to talk about what this means and some of the gaps and why um, you might default into anger in some areas. I, I, I can't wait. It's going to be super exciting. Yeah. I mean, learning to control your anger, your lust, and implementing boundaries. Man, that just, they're game changers. Absolute mm-hmm. game changers, not just for us, but for our families. And so learning to operate without the guilt from implementing boundaries and being able to put in the imperfect progress in that, dude, just keep at it. Just keep at it. Give yourself grace. Keep pushing forward. And uh, man, those are so impactful, Jay, on, on the life we live. And that we create that space for our families to be in as well. I, I talk about this later on. There's another episode where there's, I, I think it's like the last episode that we're going to review here, but the point, but th- this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyways. That's a weird saying. Anyways, <laughs> if that's the idea, like if it's worth creating, it's worth protecting. Yeah. And just reflect on that. So if you have, if you if you want to create peace, you want to create strength, you want to create a solid family it's worth actually doing the things to protect it and to, to maintain that that's the that's i think the core the core learning from that anger piece cool so moving on to jamie goal episode 42 unlock the secrets to creating healthy sleep habits wouldn't that be just you know scrolling through netflix and tiktok and i mean staying up late and binging right i mean those are healthy <laughs> healthy sleep habits aren't they I used to scroll through. I remember I used to scroll through Imager a lot. Uh, I am G U R, and they used to just like there were like some really great memes and just little learning things. And this was like super early in my journey and stuff like that. But uh, the sleep habits that Jamie is referring to is not his sleep habits, but the sleep habits of his kid. And so, as your kid learns to sleep through things, so too will you learn to sleep through things. And um, I think that the there was this really great. Uh, a show that my daughter was watching. It was family reunion on Netflix. And I just happened on this one scene where the parents had a newborn and they were, tr- they were sleep training the kid, uh, the, the young, the, the newborn. And it was in the other room and you could hear the baby crying off screen. And they were this comedic thing to like, not go pick up the baby. Cause it's, it's kind of all this training. And um, what I loved about uh, like, that's kind of the comedy thing. And all of us, I think, all of us fathers have this moment where we're where we're figuring this out, figuring out sleep habits. But the end of it and of this conversation with Jamie was, I thought, really, really, um, really profound. Was and it's 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 another one of those things that's completely obvious once you hear it. Which was, don't build your life around your baby. Incorporate your baby into your life. And so there are some activities and habits that you got to get rid of, like stop going to the bar, stop doing that nonsense stuff, like do more family activities. But he he told the story about how he went boating with his kid at like four weeks or something like that. And I was like, I was kind of reflecting on, I was like, yeah, you know, like if I go back in time in history and like I grew up somewhere and we had to go on a hunt, it was likely that like that baby was strapped on somebody's back and like you just went hunting and like, like that was life. And I, I think there's a little bit of Hollywood that we've been sort of like sold that these are the healthy things that your baby's life has to be on a crib and, and like they have to have their own space and be in the room. I was like kind of jazz, but if I, if I were to go back 150 years and then like for the rest of human history, most kids were stuck on one of the parents and you lugged them around with everything you did. I don't know. Like, I think, I think that was just this really profound moment of just, Hey, are, these are the things you like doing. Bring your kid to go do them. Kind of ties back into, uh, letting them be outside that you talked about earlier, you know, 100%. It's like involve them in, in the outdoors and, and the stuff that you're doing. Um, all right. Episode 43 with Adam Lane Smith, rebuild your marriage and strengthen your fatherhood. What caused you to like reflect on that was impactful from this one? Number one, um, Adam Lane Smith 
is a fantastic uh, influencer. He has a, a really big brand. He's been on some of the largest podcasts uh, um, around. And so it was, it was really fun to talk to him. And we had a really great conversation uh, offline about the different impacts on uh, the family unit that happened basically around the Industrial Revolution. And so I had this idea that there was generational trauma, but it couldn't be the world wars because if it was only the world wars, then only men would be suffering from this generational trauma. But what we're learning about things with regards to how family units are put together, it's both men and women. And so it's like, okay, so it can't be the wars because it can't just be this like war, war torn thing. There has to be something else going on. And he was able to really articulate in a very concise way what that means. Um, I don't remember what's in the show, but uh, comment below if you want to know what the what the five core areas were and what the what the big cause and why we're relearning and rebuilding things after the industrial revolution kind of like effed things up for the family unit. In any case, back to it, right? So he's uh, he's attachment Adam Adam Lane Smith. He's an expert, a former marriage and family therapist, um, expert on attachment theory. And the number one things that your, uh, your wife is going to be, uh, uh, what her attachment issue is probably going to be is going to be anxiety. And then, uh, you dad, your, uh, you father, your number one issue is likely going to be emotional distance. And so, um, when you consider that, uh, um, what does it, you know, when you listen to the messages of what women say, women say, I want him to be vulnerable. Um, what that means is just the emotionally available. Sometimes that means listening. Sometimes it means being, I, I, I just, I just like the word, um, the vulnerability. Cause I don't, it's not a very, it's not a good word that, um, um, communicates in a way that men understand what to do. Be open to sharing what's going on with you and being open to receiving what's going on with her or your spouse. That's what, uh, being emotionally open means. Um, just being open to share it. That's, that's what vulnerability means in a very concise, inclusive way. And then anxiety. Um, I love, you know, with this one, I think one of the habits that I learned was understanding that for her, well, I don't know. It, it's, it's hard because I don't really speak too much on, on this piece. I have some theories and, and a lot of them are unsubstantiated about this piece. But learning about attachment, one of the books that he wrote, which is, um, Exhausted Wives, Bewildered Husbands was a great read. I listened to that in a car trip with my wife, and we sort of learned a lot about it. And she had her reactions. I had my reactions. Um, it was great. It was a, this, this interview is really good. Annalyn Smith is the real deal. He has a lot of opinions on things. Um, and most of it is about, you know, um, being positively masculine and how to turn your life around as a dude. Like it just, it was a great interview about that. Uh, fantastic. What was your, your real big takeaways from the episode limiting beliefs to empowering parenting uh, with Wendy Rovers episode 44? I love this one. Uh, this was the only, it was weirdly the only interviewer in the past year that said this. And I, it, it's a huge piece of feel good fatherhood. It's one of our pillars. It's the idea is that the only person that's responsible for you being happy and for you being healthy and for you being well is you. Like nobody else is responsible for that. Uh, and so she was just like, take responsibility for it. Like if you're not happy, take responsibility. Number one, take responsibility for the fact that you're not happy and maybe just be happy. Uh, that's a little bit of a things or resolve the things that aren't making you happy. You know, uh, are, are you unhealthy? Uh, you know, Mike, you and I talk about, you know, how I work out and the kind of different things that I'm doing with that. And it's like, well, the only person that could change that, the only person that can change my eating habits, the only person that can lift weights for me is me. And so I even, I lifted this morning, like new, new personal best. Yeah. Um, uh, today. So <laughs> kind of going back to it as the only person that can do that is me and you. So you, the listener, the only person that can do that is you. And, uh, Wendy was the only guest that talked about this, that about taking full responsibility very directly and concisely this statement a lot of people came at it uh, indirectly or from the side uh yeah it was a good interview it was fun yeah the crazy thing is when we look to like our spouse or our children or work whatever to be the ones to make us happy right we're 
giving away our power, our ability, our strength, and not taking that responsibility. Whereas, dude, when you and I look at ourselves and go, okay, what am I able to do that gives me back that happiness, my well-being, my joy, it, it gives us a different perspective about what the options are and puts it in an obtainable way for us to take action instead of something that you know, maybe if we're lucky will happen. Um, it just puts us in a totally different mindset and, and place to, to be intentional and purposeful, um, to just move forward and say, yeah, I claim my happiness. I'm not, I'm not subjugating, you know, just relinquishing it to somebody else. So yeah. If you, if you want to learn how to apply this intrinsic versus intrinsic motivation concept, to your life, it is as simple as this. Be driven by the things that you want and need and ignore the things that are from the outside, period. Be driven by the things that you want and need and ignore the things that are outside of you that are like coming in and stop pushing out blame to things outside. That's what taking responsibility means. If you are driven by the things that you want and need, if you have goals and things that you're running towards, a lot of the noise just like f's off. It goes away. It 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 is a focusing mechanism to to really just in a weird way pay attention to things that you want to need. And the way that I've articulated this, <laughs> we joke about this in the house, is that as men as a father, you're built to chase the mammoth for five days. Like, go back in time. We chased the thing that we threw spears into until it died. Then we lugged it back to camp. Like it's, it's what it's in here to just, what do you need food? Okay. We're, we're okay. Great. I'm going, I'm, I'm, it's over there on the horizon. Okay, good. Go chase the woolly mammoth. <laughs> like We're going to get it with a spear for days, for days. Right. And, um, it, it's okay to have belonging. That's an okay. It's a great motivation to say, I want to belong to a tribe. Like I want to belong to my people. I want to belong to that. That's a great motivation to have. What's a poor motivation is I want, um, is that I so desperately need acceptance of the people that I want to belong to that tribe that I'm allowing them to define who I am. That's self-destructive behavior. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. We're good. All right. What did you pull out of your conversation with Jeff Goodrich, Dude and Duder, episode 45? I just, a man and his dog, like the, I have, um, I have a whoop. So this is a, I don't even know, like the 50 years into the future when you're somehow listening to this in the Congress, um, uh, records or whatever, uh, cause YouTube's gonna be forever. Uh, the whoop, it was a device that I wore on my wrist that measured everything. And the one thing that I noticed the most is it was the great thing was that my heart rate goes down when I'm sitting with my dog or walking my dog or hanging out with my dog, uh, me. <laughs> when I'm doing that, when my dog Luna, uh, and, uh, Jeff transformed his life by taking his dog for walks. I mean, talk about, talk about something profound and simple. Uh, our second, our second, um, longest domesticated animal companion. Uh, if you want to know what the first is, you gotta, you gotta comment below. Then, then I'll let you know, um, uh, ask for it. What's the companion? Uh, but the dogs are Mansfield's friend. We've been around them for, for so long. And just that the, the relationship with his dog, Duder, was really kind of what transformed his life. A couple high level things, guiding over controlling. Don't tell your kids what to do. Um, point them in the direction of what your values are and leave from the front. That's guiding. Um, highlight the things that they can improve. That's, that's another way. Uh, the other thing too, which I've, I've given a lot of thought to, and there, there may be a product in the future about, um, uh, new, new father onboarding, uh, was that nobody, because of the, in Emily Smith, we talked about the destruction of the family unit and we talked about, uh, where that mentorship and information comes from. And, uh, nobody is really helping new fathers. If you have a poor, like 20% of the population that doesn't have a friend or closer, they don't have a network that can help them support them. I suspect it's going to be close to about 50%. Cause like, Hey, guess what? The, the divorce rate's about 50%. I would say that about 50% of people out there don't know what to do as a new parent. And so they're completely overwhelmed. They have no idea how to handle this. 
their emotional capacity has bloomed. It's now infinite. That's the, the fundamental difference between a single man and a father is that a single man has an emotional capacity up to about 200 points if he's with somebody, 100 points if he's single. It goes infinite once you have kids. I don't know how to explain this more as a father. I don't know if I can explain it to people that are, are single or don't have kids, but consider yourself between specifically for a man that those are the numbers as a single guy, 100 as a, as a guy with somebody that you care about romantically, that's about 200. And then as a father, your emotional capacity goes infinite. So nobody's telling guys that this is about to happen. Nobody's telling new fathers this is about to happen. And, and so a lot of fathers make mistakes. A lot of fathers don't know what to do. They're not prepared. There's no information. There's no support. And so that's, I think that's why there's this new influx of fathers and father community and little masterminds and groups. And, you know, the feel good father community will be starting up here in 2024. So like it's needed and this is, this is real. So if you're a father, one of the big indications of a grown man, thank you, Scott Galloway, amazing person. This was on a Bill Maurer interview. One of the most reasonable expectations of a grown, mature man is to be able to mentor and um, sire and support kids that aren't your own. Mm. And the transferring of wisdom and the transferring of experience and knowledge is a time armor tradition of being a human being. And so reach out to your buddy that's got, that's a new father, help him out. Uh, part one was Hugh Edwards, new buddy, helped him out, had some conversations. He and I still talk. It's a great thing. And um, yeah. That was Dude and Duder, Jeff Goodridge. Yeah, I think the fatherhood manual that we get is the uh, just recovered version of everything a man knows about a woman, right? Where it's all the blank pages. And it's like, my <laughs> child, great. my child uh, just, you know, projectile vomited. What do I do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> There's all these things that you experience and you're just like, I, I don't know what to do. I'm just standing here and trying to figure this out to the best of my ability. Yeah. yeah. Wish there was some kind of a uh, book to have, you know, read and gotten some clues on that actually would have helped out. But yeah. Um, so going on to episode 46, that was with Joe Rubin building a strong and happy family. This one is so concise model, fun model, excellence, Set your examples both in person and online. Your kids will be online. They will likely connect with you and watch what you do. So model excellence in all areas, both in person and on in the digital environment. Uh, just model the good behavior that you want to see. And then we spoke a little bit about online protection. So the part of the one of the reasons why you probably don't see a lot of my kids um, or my spouse for that matter online is because we have a value of digital privacy. Uh, for your kids, and this is something to understand, is that when you put your your pictures online at any of the digital uh, social media platforms, you no longer own those pictures. They are the property of that platform. So when you post on Facebook, they are the property of Facebook. When you post them on even in Google, on your Google phone, your Apple phone, they're the property of Google or Apple. You have um, ceded rights to those properties. And for us, we believe that our kids, uh, our daughters in particular, need to have an understanding of what it means when they're posting pictures online. And so we don't force them into having pictures of them as a kids online because, and we try and encourage our family to do so, because it's a consensual thing and they, they can't consent until they're 18. Th them's the breaks. And so we're not putting pictures of them up until they're 18. Um, and then any of the few pictures that we do have, um, Again, that's kind of our choice and we've broken this either in the moment or, or not, but like we don't put daily pictures up. I, I don't really talk about them too much um, outside of this channel and on the podcast. And, and that's just really to respect that privacy, and respect their autonomy. Um, that autonomy is a big value for, um, for me in the, in the Twining House is that people have that autonomy, the ability to make their own choices. Um, that's something that we value. And so this is a, an extension of that. Makes sense. Episode 47, Taming the Imposter, John Melora. What did you uh, take away from there? Very rarely do you ever get to speak to an actual rocket scientist. <laughs> he, he was one. 
So uh, it was super fun. Uh, uh, it was a great conversation. I, and I, I had the privilege of spending some time with John as well offline. He's, he's some of the new, uh, new friends. Uh, the next one, Tony, is another one. Um, uh, some, good, some good relationship there. Uh, here, it was uh, really that we all have some sort of self-doubt. We all have something that uh, we're unsure of. Not every, not every man is a, is a blustering, overconfident uh, superhero. So uh, the, the most concrete way to do this is to acknowledge your history and measure what you've done and actually write it down. So you can write, write that stuff down and measure what you've accomplished. I did a review, um, I think of the past 10 years or so in a newsletter that I write. And it was amazing. It was amazing to go back and review the things that I accomplished. And I did this as a, what was the theme of that year? So of this year that you're looking at, what was the major thing that you accomplished? It kind of defined that year. Have one year defining activity. And uh, yeah, and part of confidence is knowing what you've accomplished and where you've come from. And so um, that's what I learned from John. Gotcha. What did you pull away from your conversation with Tony in episode 48, Fatherhood Reflections as a Protector and a Father Figure? So um, there was a great, there was a lot of stuff that we talked about. So Tony is a single father, uh, but one of the great TED Talks I watched, it was like locker room talk according to, to, according to who. And, you know, like I've, I've been very critical of the sentence, like boys will be boys, like why? And according to what? Um, people rise to the standards that you set for them. And so if you allow boys to do whatever and be whoever, then they'll rise to that standard and it'll just create like stupid issues that can be avoided. Um, it's the same thing for girls. Um, so boys and girls have that, that same standard. But the, the TED Talk was, I think, fantastic because it really was this confrontational thing. It was kind of like, well, why is it acceptable for guys to speak about other people in the way that they do and whatever you would consider the locker room talk? I can tell you, Hollywood. Um, you know, this great culture creator, because I, I, I both love and have issues with, with everything that Hollywood does. Um, the humanities are critically important. And believe me, I don't want Hollywood to be disbanded. I just want, um, you have to discern, you have to learn uh, and be able to critically think about the things you're consuming and not blindly follow them. Uh, that's a feel good father thing too. There's lots of feel good father things on the show. In any case, so uh, the, whole, the whole conversation here was, um, he was a single dad of daughters. Um, and so what's the standard for interaction? Right. That was really the, the kind of thing here. What, what was the standard from this conversation? The second one was to be your own hero. Uh, live a life that you're proud of. And if you're doing things, if you're accomplishing what you want and you're writing down what you need and you communicate that and you accomplish it, you can become your own hero. Be somebody that you're proud of to look into the mirror. Be somebody that you're proud of to be associated with because guess what? When your epitaph is written, that's the person it's going to be. That's the legacy that you create. Yeah. And writing those things down so that when times get tough, you know, we're, we're kind of feeling the weight of life, writing those things down so that we can reflect and remind ourselves, Hey, these are, these are the milestones that I've overcome. This is the hero that I am, right? That, that carries such strength when we feel like we're just overwhelmed and don't have any power. So Next, we had episode 49, Overcoming Obstacles and Embracing Community with Tanner Welsh. This was, I think, there's this, there's this habit that I, I have where there's, there's certain movies or cultural moments that I'm so grateful that I got to experience and reflect on. And one of the movies that I watch on a, on a regular cadence, I would say every couple of years I'll watch this movie, is Black Hawk Down. I really feel like that particular movie is this great, like not only is the cast absolutely stunning and amazing, um, but really it's this really wide swath of like just really positive masculinity, very positive masculine roles and characters, and archetypes and ways that people are interacting with each other. And it's this, this great thing about brotherhood and the, but there's a second reason why I watch Black Hawk Down and, you know, it has to do with some of the conversations that are on like, um, uh, Jocko Willenick's podcast is that I am so grateful that I am not a soldier and I'm so grateful that they exist and that there are people that are these warriors of society, that there are these soldiers and that they're doing what they're doing. 
and I remind myself because I almost, I almost enlisted and I remind myself through these that, um, there are these sacrifices and these people that have lives that are pretty standard when you consider human experience that, um, hu- uh, I love this. This is a a great point here was that if you talk to an American, um, most Americans about what's the nature of the world, they'll say the nature of the world is good and humans are good to each other and we're good people. We have nice values and stuff like that. And if you talk to somebody um, and the example they ended up using was Africa. And if you talk to somebody in Africa with everything that kind of goes on there, they're saying, well, people are violent and people kill other people and resources are scarce. And you always have to be on your guard and you never know whether the other person has your back. So the military community has, you know, they've looked at what I think is the more normal version of humanity, which is the infighting and the violence and the take what you can because resources are scarce. And um, so they've seen that. And I'm just grateful that they, that they do that. I, I brought this whole thing up and I know it's kind of dour and not really great, but Tanner is Tanner has a fatherhood that I hope to God nobody nobody experiences. His daughter and his and the mother of his daughter are in a different I think it's daughter. Well, they're in a different country. And it's unlikely that he will have a relationship with his child before the age of 18. Because it, it, it's just like, wh- like when I think about like the things that I struggle with and the and any of the challenges that I face, like I'm not dealing with that. I'm not dealing with a mom of my child who lives in a different country that's difficult for me to get to. That is estranged and doesn't want me to have a relationship with my kids and like all these different things that are weighing on me and. Tanner is this optimistic, accepting individual. And I'm not playing, I don't, I, don't, I have no, outside of the story and some of the other things like that, I have no details about either person, except that I'm sure that she's doing the best she can. And I'm sure that Tanner's doing the best that he can. And I'm sure that they have a history together. That's really the only thing that I'm certain of. But really, it's, it's these, like the Black Hawk Down, you know, this conversation with Tanner just really reminded me to put, my life in fricking perspective about uh, just about what what are the challenges and conflicts that I deal with on a regular basis and what are the things that he's dealing with and I was able to completely change my life so that I could have more time with my kids he can't like he can't he can't do that and um if if you have an opportunity to meet somebody like this in your life walk alongside them put your hand on their shoulder and tell them it's going to be okay Hmm. Well, that one matches up really well with your next one. Episode 50 with uh, Kyle Zunger, A Father's Letter of Love, Faith, and Embracing Fatherhood. So this one's crazy because this is the letter that Kyle wrote to his father, and he talks about this. So frequently, we always think that there's time. So this is the inverse of the seize the day, carpe diem, memento mori philosophy of uh, Stoicism, of, I don't know, Latin, Greeks, whatever. <laughs> right? That's, that's uh, Carpe Diem. Uh, but just this whole idea of, hey, you know, uh, you, like the, today's the only day that really matters and the way that you act in the moment right now is what matters. Uh, so when I went to college, they had all of us new um, college acceptances, acceptance, whatever, freshmen. All the freshmen read Tuesdays with Maury, which is this great book about just building deep relationships with people that are your elders that have life experience and just enjoy that. Um, but even another influencer recently said he was very confronted with, at a certain point, he wrote down how much time he spends with his parents on average and then how many years based on the averages that he was going to. And he was like, I calculated it was like 20 hours. He's like, I'm going to be able to spend the equivalency of like two to three days in a row with them if you're spending a standard work day with them. And he was like, it really kind of made me way more intentional about the time that I spend. And this feel good fatherhood 
perspective and value here is that 90% of the time that you're going to spend with your kids is before they're 18. I'm going to say that one more time because it's a significant statistic. 90% of the time you'll spend with your kids is spent before they turn 18. And so this is really the majority of the time you'll spend with them when you get to create experiences and memories with them, when you get to shape them and mold them with your values and the good things of life, when you get to teach them to be positive and optimistic, show them that they can accomplish great things and just like be like the biggest freaking cheerleader you can. Because once they become once they become an adult and they move out, your time with them drastically d- diminishes and you become a sideways observer. Like you're not really even a part of their everyday life. And that is just, I don't, if, I don't know if there's anything that's more confronting than that number. I will tell you this from being a father of four adult children. When they are younger, you'll be begging for peace. When they become adults, you're begging for their time. Mm. And so think about how much time, like you talked about, we spend with our parents. The shoe will be on the other foot. You may be in the midst of diapers or, um, you know, activities, but make the most of every moment that you have with them, whether they're under 18 or over 18, Mm. it may be going for ice cream, you know, to if expenses or time are a limiting thing, um, you know, it may be going for an afternoon to, um, do an activity that you both love, but take the initiative prioritize it because this is something that you are going to be investing in when they're younger that draws them to want to still be involved with you uh, when they're adults and they've got all kinds of other things drawing their attention away. So, um, dude, that 90%, I will vouch for it. Um, Invest wisely just as you would do anything financially, this even more so. Thank Uh, you. Yeah. Can you tell that this is something near and dear to my heart? (laughs) Being a father of four with three uh, grandchildren and also being um, kind of in that transition phase, I guess I would say, Jay, where it's Mm -hmm. like three of the four parents have passed and we now have an aged parent. Um, Time becomes a different commodity as Mm -hmm. we age and our perspective changes. you know, so it's like take advantage of what you have now so that that regret doesn't come later in our lives. Um, yeah. Moving on to the next one. So we've got episode 51, Tending to Our Surroundings with Brian Young. What did you take away and, and implement from this one? Brian was another one of those where I built a great relationship with him after the fact, and he's all about helping his family and his kids thrive. And so that's, um, it's super good uh, to be really concise here. He, we talked about being present. I mean, and everything we've been talking about here is is really aligned with this. And so, what is being present? That means being focused and attentive to what's happening right now. And uh, so, the direct application for me with this was just putting down the phone. Like I, I shared earlier on, how I sit down with my morning coffee and just watch the sunrise every single morning, and I do that disconnected i have a record player so sometimes i'll put on a record but i i'm i'm not looking at my phone i'm not doing anything like that in fact i'm i've recently just adopted a don't look at the phone in the morning so like what i do is i'll look like anyways the whole point is i'm not looking at my phone until uh, until i'm well into mid-morning uh which is really good um but that that being present and that that presence opens up a lot of opportunity for interaction, for care, and for uh, for peace. That's and so this this was that that's what this discussion was all about. Mm-hmm. Being present without those distractions is kind of what it sounds like, right? Being um, engaged in the conversation that's there. So, yeah, something I've uh, struggled with. So. <laughs> I'm going to go check that one out and take some notes on that one, Jay. Um, Episode 52 with Justin Davis, Rediscovering Identity and Overcoming Abandonment. This was this incredible trip down down this street of a bunch of people that just didn't tell each other the truth. Mm. And it was 
crazy. What what my favorite my, my favorite fiction world is The Wheel of Time. I've I've read it's one of the the few book series that I've read. I think I've read through it five times now. And the almost all the conflicts in the Will of Time would be solved if the good guys talk to each other and the bad and like like if people just talk to each other. Cause then the good guys could be like, wait, hold on, you're a bad guy. <laughs> just like figure it out. Cause we want the good guys to win, right? And uh this was for for Justin, the strength of character to to turn the generational pattern of just not telling, like not living in the truth is it's it, it kind of blew my mind that that this was this was a, an experience that people have, and I, it, it's not like in a judgmental world, but just kind of like I, I can't believe that would be so exhausting. Like, um, uh, the my my personal motto is is really just can can you be the same person in every single room that you're in? Uh, and this comes from one of my um a, a family member of me telling me <laughs> this is so great. Uh, we were in the um. Uh, Tavern on the Greens. This is in Central Park in New York City. It, the, the restaurant no longer exists, but she said, "You know, it's it's really so funny that um, she said I always tell people the truth because then I don't have to remember. I don't have to remember anything." Hmm. It was like kind of the the extension of that. Like if I, if you're always telling the truth, you don't have to remember who you are. Or who's you don't have to play that game of like of of that that. I don't even know what to describe it, the drama that unfolds from that. But this was really just like, and the, the impact of it. So, you know, like Justin figured out that like who he thought his dad was, wasn't his dad. And then like, and then, you know, there was some infidelity and it's all oh, blah, blah, like all this crazy stuff just from not telling people the truth and um, turned it all around, mended the relationships, fixed everything. And is like, uh, really helps other people do the same thing. That's really admirable from that, putting in that effort and turning his life around. But whoa. I mean, I, I never thought I would meet a hero from the will of time in real life. And I did. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> so that was, that was my conversation with Justin. Hmm. Uh, let's move on to uh, Jared Haley from episode 53, nurturing the soul, strengthening the family. What I, you you know what? It was, I, I, I made a joke that uh, I was going to have more health influencers in 2024. And I, it just, it was crazy, but like, so Jared Haley works at a gym that is just like YouTube and like podcasting brand. And he's sort of the, he is the wellness and spiritual side of the, of the ensemble cast for this podcast. Uh, it's escaping me. The, um, the link to that, this group is likely in the, uh, in the description on YouTube. Um, but it's just, it's embracing the change getting healthy was the first piece and there'll be more discussions on that on the feel good fatherhood show in 2024 uh but the other piece that i that might become something new here might become this pillar point as we're talking about personal branding and brand builders group and that whole methodology is that most people think success is getting a little bit every a little bit better every day i think that when you add on to well if you can make your generations, your family a little bit better every day as well. That that's really what's the most important. And um, there are some recent statistics that I've read about academic and career performance as you climb the socioeconomic ladder. And this is less so for, because this is kind of obvious as you get higher and higher, but I would even reflect on it that um, make yourself the best person you can and Try to at least get into those high five figure, if not six figure positions, if possible, if not higher, if you can, and just make as much money as you can for yourself and your family, because the statistics are very clear. The data is very clear. Having the income to invest into your family and to invest into experiences and to invest into tutors and support and all the other things that you can and creating that stability, it has a lasting generational impact. Yeah, it absolutely does. You talked about the legacy. That's going to be part of that investment for the legacy. Well, Jay, this is our last one. Episode 54, Shannon Carpenter, mentorship, self-confidence, and failure. What did you draw away from this? 
Shannon Carpenter is another one of those influencers that's been working on the fatherhood and uh, men's issues kind of like world. Uh, he, he got some, um, some good press, but he talked a little bit about paternity leave. Um, as, as a father, uh, I was lucky enough to have a place of work that gave me 10, 10, 10 days of paid leave. Uh, I'm grateful for that. As a Canadian, <laughs> oh, as a Canadian, you get a year off. So, uh, that might, that, that might not be as true recently, but I remember my uncle, um, who still lives in Canada being flabbergasted when I told him how much time I got off, uh, and just his reaction to that, like what, uh, so that's some of the work that Shannon Carpenter has done. And he's, he's a, he's a funny humorous guy and a writer and does all this kind of stuff. But my favorite part about this, and this is something that we believe we talked about this multiple times in this episode and in the part one episode is just teach your kids how to navigate life. Here's the example. Here's the counter example. The older you get, if you're not able to cook and you're old, it's not cute. It's kind of a bit shameful. Teach your kids just life skills. Teach them how to survive and teach them how to thrive. Teach them how to survive. That's like how to take care of the house, how to be clean, how to cook. You know, how do you thrive? Build relationships, discipline, study, educational ac acumen. That's kind of like, that was the big thing. And since a big part of feel good, feel good fatherhood is being aware of the world. So um, there are some people that I know, especially in the Christian world that have told me some of these things, and this might be a misinterpretation on my part as a Christian to only look to good things. Um, I don't believe that's what the intent of that is, to ignore the bad things in the world. I think the part of the dichotomy, especially of a Christian world, is the idea of um, acknowledging that you are um, a sinner and acknowledging that you're not quite hitting the mark acknowledging that you're um that you have a sinful nature and you're born in the world of the flesh that's a biblical language that they're using um, um and all it means is that you're just you're sinning so i, I don't want to get into it too much too much here but uh the, the conversation went only look at the good things and don't don't look at bad things and it, the context was a little bit on horror movies but i, I extend it even beyond there because i i think that if it's a pervasive thought um we have to look at societal trends. We have to look at what's going on in the world and we have to be aware and willing to engage them. When Abraham went and rescued his uh, nephew, Lot, he brought an army with him and he killed the fuckers. All right, that's the second swear word. So I could still be PG-13. Um, <laughs> so, but the point here is that in order to defeat things in the world that are e evil or things that need to be fixed, you have to be willing to look at them. If you don't have the fortitude or the resiliency or the strength of character to be able to look at things that, that say are undesirable or unhealthy, uh, we talked about lust, we talked about anger, right? Those are uh, desire in and of itself, not healthy desire, but unhealthy desire as a character trait is not something that you should be proud of. It's something that you should solve. At the time of this recording, there are crazy things happening. It's the first time we've had two specific wars that are happening concurrently in the same part of the world in the past 50 years. Like society is going to dramatically shift and change. You have to be aware of what's happening in your backyard as well as what's happening globally because you have the capability of doing that in the same way. And, and here's the pattern. So let me explain what the pattern is. If you as a human being, and this goes to everybody a part of the feel good community, if you as a human being take care of yourself, then you can take care of your spouse. Then you can take care of your family. Then you can take care of your street. Then you can take care of your neighborhood. Then you can take care of your place of work. Then you can take care of your city. Then you can take care of your state. Then you can take care of your country. Then you can take care of the world. And that's the order. But if you don't take care of yourself and you don't start there, nothing else matters. You don't get to interact at any other level. That's the feel good. That's the feel good way. That's a feel good community way. That's how we change it. And all of this is the cue up that what we talked about on, with Shannon Carpenter was male loneliness. We talked about the friendship academic, um, 
epidemic, but male loneliness. Uh, the, the thing to really acknowledge here is that like, you have to consider what is the way that I look at it is like, what is the absolute worst state for a person, for an individual? And the absolute worst, worst state for a person or an individual is to commit suicide. And there's a direct line from male loneliness to suicide, period. And it comes from loneliness being equated to in a man's mind as worthlessness. And people that th- consider themselves worthless will commit suicide. It's just, it's there. Like, it's just a statistic. So um, you have to be able to look at ugly, ugly shit to, to create beautiful things. As, as my favorite, my favorite painter in the world, Bob Ross, sometimes you got to have a little bit of shade, a little bit of darkness to see the light. So um, make some friends, get out there, learn some life skills, be a good model, teach your kids and your families how to thrive face your family, you'll make the world a better place. Well, we've reflected back on the lessons for this past year, right? For 2023. Dude, there's been a lot that's gone on and it's a lot to take in. Can you give us some insight, some, uh, a little taste of what our appetite of what 2024 looks like, uh, what you have lined up and, and are getting ready for us to, you know, uh, learn from to kind of push our comfort zone and help us to grow to create like that legacy that you've talked about in 2023. Absolutely love it. And 100%. 20 to, so I would say year one of the Feel Good Fatherhood show was really focused on the individual and what they learned. And I really wanted to put in front of other people these models for individuals that had something that they had overcome or some sort of lesson to give and do that. And, and what I'm doing with the show in 2024 is I want to open it up to people that are building a community in some capacity through expertise or change and bringing on probably some divergent guests, some people that were, were not really, that we may or may not think that might be meaningful and asking them in their expertise, what could, how could a feel good father impact this in a positive light? So I would expect to see more discussions about some women's issues and understanding what our spouse might be going through, or our wife for that matter, what she might be going through, what our daughters might be going through. I would expect to see, um, I would really love to see, and I'm, I'm currently pursuing this, some of like what the gay community and what gay fatherhood looks like in today's day and age. It's, it's kind of not really that safe for them right now. So I don't, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. Um, but I think in general, I would expect to see we're really moving into a world of understanding, empathy, and skill development. And those are going to be the core things that the 2024 year for Feel Good Father is going to focus on that. The community is going to be up and running. I expect that my newsletter will be started any day now, depending on when you're doing that. Um, I'm opening up the mastermind as well. So expect that piece. If you're interested, just comment in the, the section. We'll, we'll connect in some way, shape, or form. Uh, that's, where, that's where Feel Good Fatherhood is going, moving uh, at, least, well, at least for 2024, maybe moving forward. Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> awesome. Well, dude, sounds like there's a lot more coming down the pike. And uh, man, it, if there's something in both episode one or episode two of this year in reflection, we now have the, you know, the, the post, the signs to go back and check those out. And heck, if we listen to it once, listen to it again and see what else you pick up from it. So Jay, congratulations. This has been an amazing year one excited to see what's for year two and the growth and opportunities that come for us as fathers to continue growing in community, uh, to beat that loneliness and isolation, to set this up for long-term success. So thank you, my friend, and congratulations. Thank you so much for that, Mike. And then also, I really want to take this brief moment to thank you, the listener. Thanks for, thanks for listening for an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> I appreciate that. If you've, if you've done that, comment below, what was your favorite part? What's the episode that you enjoyed the most? I really do get a lot of, um, I really do get a lot of satisfaction from hearing how this has improved your life. 
And I know that uh, many of you don't share, but um, if you do, you want to share what, what's been meaningful to you, I'd love to connect. I'd love to hear what you found meaningful. And I do that. I, I'd say right now, today, 20% of this is me learning about other people, learning from other people, and building this podcast. But 80% is because I know if you're hearing my voice right now and you're listening to me say this, that this is impacting you in a positive way. And that's, um, that's really meaningful to me. Uh, love you lots. And we'll see you or we'll hear you or we'll talk with you very soon.